Είναι πολύ μεγάλη χαρά και τιμή να υποδέχομαι την Βικτόρια Χίσλοπ και να έχω μια κουβέντα μαζί τη. Νομίζω ότι δεν χρειάζεται πολλέ συστάσει, ακόμα και για του ανθρώπου που δεν έχουν δει το νησί. Αμφιβάλλω αν υπάρχουν δύο-τρει στην ελληνική επικράτεια. Σίγουρα έχουν διαβάσει τα βιβλία του και σίγουρα ξέρουν την πολύ ιδιαίτερη σχέση που έχει με την πατρίδα μα. Η κουβέντα θα γίνει στα αγγλικά. Έτσι κι αλλιώ η Βικτόρια μιλάει θαυμάσια ελληνικά. Αλλά είπαμε να το κάνουμε στα αγγλικά για λόγους οικονομίας. So I'm going to switch in English. My name is... Hello, Sneska. My name is Margarita Purnara. I am a cultural correspondent and a columnist for Kathimerini's newspaper in Athens. It is a great joy and an honor to have the privilege to interview Victoria Hislop. She is a writer very close to our hearts. And I would like to tell you why, or I suspect the reason why. Uh, we Greeks, we crave to be loved for our modern selves, not just ancient glory. And in your books, Victoria, you have written a lot about a recent past, be it the Second World War, be it the Civil War, the Junta, the Cyprus tragedy. So by reading your books, when you're Greek, uh, you are, you know, you, you're touching all these issues about traumas and conflict and ambiguities, which are hard for us to, del to deal with. Um, you are giving us a chance to reconciliate with the past. And I think this is very important, but it takes a lot of compassion. I think it takes a tremendous emotional intelligence in order to do that and much love from your part uh, to Greece. So we do live in interesting times. Uh, we are confronted with war, we are confronted with the pandemic and uncertainties which shape our future. And um, I think it's very important. It's, it's, I believe that to have here somebody like you, you write historical fiction, you're able to give us a different perspective on things. And um, one of the things we're going to discuss today is what literature, not history, can teach us about our past. But I would like to start our conversation um, from something else. Um, in 2020, you were granted uh, honorary Greek citizenship. So I would like to ask you, how do you feel now, being Greek, officially Greek, for two years, and also, how's life after Brexit? Oh, big questions. Protapola, Kalimera, Seolus. And I'll continue to speak in English, but it, it, it seems a bit strange. The first time I was interviewed by Margarita was in, in Greek, and um, I'll go outside afterwards and find some <laughs> Greek conversation. Um, the citizenship has meant so much to me, it's almost hard to put it into words. Um, it came really out of the blue one day during 2020 and I had a call from Mr. Mitsotakis and my first thought was that it was a friend, you know, doing a very, very good impersonation. Um, but actually he does have a very distinctive voice and he was offering me this, this great gift and of course the gift means two things to me. It means that I am actually Greek. I mean, I really do feel Greek. And the day of uh, taking my oath, which was in September 2020, um, it felt extremely serious, you know, to say words like Kathigonda and <laughs> to be born Greek, I think it's very different from becoming Greek because you didn't have a, a choice. You came into the world that, that way. And to actually swear this oath um, of allegiance to this country felt like almost the most serious thing I'd ever done in my life. Um, and then, of course, there's the aspect of remaining a European. Um, and, you know, my, my heart felt like it bled when we left Europe. You know, I feel profoundly European. And yet, I just brought two little visual aids to show people. Now when you replace your British passport, you get a blue one. And that feels to me tragic. Um, 
but I also have my red one still. And, and you know, this one, I'm very uh, proud to say, is the one that I really treasure. Um, so it was a wonderful gift. I went 10 days ago to uh, the citizenship ceremony at the Greek Embassy for Professor Macridge, a professor of modern Greek at Oxford. And it reminded me again of the seriousness of being given and being made an honorary Greek uh, and what a wonderful thing it is. Brexit, um, gosh, like everything that happens in Boris Johnson's life, he's always sort of almost rescued <laughs> by the next crisis. Um, so you, you mean he's lucky? Well, he's lucky because um, we went straight from these reflections about what Brexit meant for us and into a pandemic and now we've gone into a war. So people still haven't... So are you implying there's something worse coming? Well, always something takes the focus away and at the moment the focus on Brexit has sort of, it's been obscured. Um, but the immediate repercussions, you know, are being felt. We have um, a shortage of medical staff, because many Europeans, they left. They didn't feel they were really part of the UK anymore, and, and to some extent, they were right. Um, and a shortage of, of staff in residential homes, in places where we care for old people, and there are many of those in the UK. And of course, during the pan pandemic, having a shortage of staff there, because many of them were from place, you know, countries in Europe. Um, and then we had the shortage of lorry drivers, so we had a crisis with availability of fuel for our cars. So suddenly, people had no, nothing in their petrol tanks. Um, so it's, it's the beginning, really. Um, but I, I feel slightly distant from it. I have to be really honest, because I have my my red passport. Your red passport. <laughs> yes. Um, it's so interesting that you say that all these successive waves of facts and, and you know, events are, are changing our lives and we don't have the time to think about what has happening, uh, what, what was happening, what is happening now. So it, it, it's very interesting, your point of view, that we need time. We need more time to, to think about things. Mm. Um, meanwhile, so many um, horrible things are happening around us, uh, like the pandemic or the war, and I was wondering, how do you feel? How do you personally cope with these things? And like, after having watching, watched the news on the TV, how do you feel? Mm. I think I feel, as we all do in Europe, um, just this is a tragedy, that this can have been allowed to happen, and that we've almost watched the, you know, the gradual arrival of it. It didn't happen overnight. Um, I think because I'm generally a pessimist, and that strangely prepares you for difficulty. Um, you know, when Ukraine was surrounded by Russian tanks, and I, I heard intelligent people saying, oh, He's just making a point. He's not, you know, I said, of course he's going to invade. What else is, is he doing there? And similarly, actually, with the pandemic, I, could, I had a feeling that would, you know, sweep our old lives, you know, out of the way. Um, I suppose what I do to, to cope with it, apart from do the, the practical things in terms of Ukraine, like, you know, helping financially and as a family we've sat down and agreed that we will take a family you know if Britain's going to allow enough people in you know, Britain is not um, really behaving fast enough and and urgently enough to allow people to come in we're, we're really failing on it and I'm ashamed yeah, a huge criticism yes of I'm, I'm once again I'm ashamed of of my, my blue passport in this situation because we're, we're, we're setting up barriers rather than just throwing open the doors and welcoming people in. Um, I wouldn't say that at some point I will write about it in a, in a fictional 
sense because it's, it's not a country I know. Um, but in terms of dealing with it so that one's not weighed down by it moment by moment, because I think for the first two or three weeks, probably like everybody here, I was reading the news three, four, five times a day to see what the latest events uh, were. And I realized that actually that, that doesn't make you any stronger yeah. to, you know, what could I actually do? It makes you hopeless sometimes. Yes, I think it does. I mean, I, I suppose my escape uh, in, in all situations is to read and to try and read something that's, um, you know, very different from the reality of what's happening. Um, but I think that's what's wonderful about coming to Delphi today is to, to really feel in this family of Europe and, you know, to feel that somehow something will come out of this forum that will strengthen Ukraine in some way because we are, you know, this one big family in Europe and Ukraine must feel that. I'm having the same hope too and um, having watched some of the conversations, I'm very glad because I, I sense that there's a strong self-criticism in the European family and I think that this might help. Yes, I mean, we're, we're um, not exactly handcuffed because there are things we can do, but we're all afraid of escalation. And there we have this incredibly brave man, Zelensky, actually almost looking us in the, in the eye and saying, help. You know, this hasn't happened, I don't think, in a, an invasion before, where you get this direct communication uh, with the individual who is, you know, trying to lead this country out of this very dark place. He's addressing uh, the, the, the Greek parliament today, so, and I think it's right now, or a bit later on. Mm. So, um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hear what uh, this leader has to say to, to Greeks, because I know that we always have this burden of history, as you know very well, and war has been something that... Uh, we know since um, ancient times in Greece. So I don't know, sometimes this existential burden is, is very hard to have uh, yes. when you're Greek. So yeah. that's um, a difficult aspect of your red passport, isn't it? Yes, it is, but I, I, I share it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, democratic citizens in Europe and, and in, in the West, in the United States, are, are feeling sad and hopeless and angry, angry because I don't know, there are very little we can do to prevent a humanitarian disaster or a war. And I was wondering whether this, we're witnessing a, a watershed moment in modern history, and I was wondering whether this could be a, a source of inspiration for you, not just for Ukraine, or writing a book on Ukraine, or on this war, but in general. Yes, well, I think my the writing that I've done in the past has been from the point of view of being a citizen of a country um, that had a relatively peaceful 20th century. You know, we, we weren't invaded. Um, and I think my writing has allowed me to live the Greek experience, to sort of step inside Greek shoes and in my imagination, I mean, my, my writing is a combination of historical fact um, and characters who are in, entirely from here. You know, they are imaginary. They're not based on any uh, real people that I've met in Greece. So I think during the writing process, I've experienced um, as much as anybody can what it is to be occupied uh, in a famine, was, as it was in um, Athens at the beginning of the occupation, this terrible famine where sure. hundreds, thousands of people died um, to experience civil war and dictatorship. I mean, all these great dramas of, I don't mean great in one, the terms of wonderful, but huge dramas that, uh, you know, have affected the Greek psyche even now. You know, I think you, you've grown up with all those just behind, you know, on your back. Um, and I think my focus has always been what women 
and children, how they experience Quite right, yes. those uh, situations, because they are the ones that are left out very often from the history books. The histories are largely about the politics and the actual events rather than the, the sort of the social history, what happens inside the home, inside the family. Um, and obviously, because of television and, and the media now, we, we see pictures every day of what, what's happening to women and children. You know, it's not, it's, it's much better recorded. Um, but in terms of Greek social history, you know, I had to dig quite hard to, to get that information. Women and children, yes, in all your books, I would say that this is the main, the main axis, the main uh, narrative. Um, could literary texts help us, help us understand the complexities of the world around us? And what could they teach us? Do we learn from history? Do we learn from literature? Or we're condemned to repeat the same mistakes? Oh, well, we're definitely condemned to repeat the same mistakes. We see that um, you know, in the world around us, unfortunately. You think, how can this, you know, how can we, we be watching another possibly mentally, well, definitely mentally unstable world leader invading another country? and killing, you know, and allowing his soldiers to, to rape women. I mean, that, it's not the first time history does repeat itself. Um, in terms of whether literary texts can help, um, that's not, in a sense, what they set out to do. That might be a, a sort of byproduct that people read and, and they, they learn about a situation. So perhaps um, they might read and think, this is something I didn't know that's happened. If I'm ever involved in that situation, I would avert it. Um, so you, you become more compassionate when you read literature? Yes, I think so. You have more understanding of things. Yes, and I think literature is a way um, to get across some aspects of history that haven't been covered by history books, by non-fiction. Um, as an example, I suppose, was writing about the Greek Civil War um, because many, or even, even the occupation of, of Greece, which was in a couple of my books, many of my British readers and French readers, because my books you know, are quite well read around other countries in Europe, you know, certainly they all said, we had no idea of the really? severity was one of, the, of the, the Greek occupation. Most uh, cruel wars, civil wars in Europe. Absolutely, but many um, education systems, certainly the British one, will teach about what happened, you know, very generally. My children are experts on the Nazis and what happened in Germany, what happened in Russia, what happened in our confrontation with Hitler. Um, but there's not a paragraph on what happened in Greece. So, you know, all these many millions of tourists that come to Greece, and wonderfully that, wonderful that they do, um, it's, they say we had no idea what Greece has lived through. And I don't, I'm not glad I've told them about such horror, about such suffering, but I'm pleased that they understand the country better a country that has this international um, sort of reputation for its beauty and its ancient past. But quite often there's been that sort of gap in, in people's knowledge. Um, and in fact, the Civil War itself, which I was warned against uh, writing about by so many Greek friends, <laughs> they said, what was don't... Their, their, their argument was what? Their argument was that it was still... Um, let's say, a minefield, what in British, we, in English, we call a minefield, a very dangerous place to go because so many uh, things have been unresolved um, and there's so much bitterness still surrounding what happened. And even in Greece, people said, you, you, you know, they, you can't write about that. It's only, it, it only finished 70 years ago. And I said, 70 years ago? 
I think it's about time. You know, that is plenty of time to pass. And, and the only way you perhaps resolve and, and come to any um, sort of conclusions about it is by discussing, not by burying things under the carpet and, you know, treating them as taboo subjects. Uh, and I think civil war um, is a very taboo subject. Here, as much as it was when I wrote about it in, for the Spanish Civil War um, in a, another novel, um, I kept finding people who wouldn't talk to me about it at all, who said it, it is a, an absolute no-go area. Um, and as a novelist, if, something, if I'm told something is a no-go area, I want to go there. There's a reason, and I'm even interested in that reason. Uh, you told us the comments that you've received before writing the book. Mm. Mm. What about after <laughs> have written the book? Um, have, uh, uh, yes, what, what did people say to you? Did, congratulations, or you've touched this issue or the other issue, or you shouldn't have written it this way or the other way? Well, the criticisms I had um, were always from people who hadn't actually read the novel. <laughs> And that I always found sort of challenging and interesting and uh, kind of pleasurable, actually. I I'll admit that I took some pleasure if I was ever, you know, I used to do, I go on book tours in Greece and usually go to about 10, 12, 15 different towns and the people of the town come and I talk about the book. And in some places in northern Greece, you know, I had somebody standing up saying, you know, how dare you um, uh, support the actions of the communists during the war? And, you know, I knew then... Are you communist? That, that you've been well, oh, yes, I'm, I'm often mistaken for a communist, which I'm wearing my, <laughs> my, my Greek flag dress today. Um, and I'd, I'd kind of ask some questions back of the person because... The line that I took about the Civil War was the line that I discovered in my research was that there were atrocities of a horrific nature on both sides. And, you know, that was, to me, my conclusion, that everybody... Uh, no, there were no winners in that Civil War. Um, you know, in Spain, it was a little bit more clear-cut. You know, the winner was Franco, you know, and the Republicans were repressed and imprisoned afterwards. I felt that book, I, I was much more on the Republican side. It was, you know, I was very anti-Franco. I'm totally um, unashamed to admit that. But with the Greek Civil War, it was far bloodier, far more uh, complex and, and, and horrific on both sides. So I, the criticisms that I had for writing about it generally... Um, you know, the people who'd actually read it said, you know, thank you for explaining this or that or the other. Because I do tend to read, you know, usually for about two years before I even start writing. How do you collect information and stories? Do you talk to people, just read, or how, how do you work before writing a book? Generally, I start with reading. You know, that is, for me, the best way to begin, um, because there's always an accounts from different political sides. Um, so I, I kind of get a good, as much as I can, a feel for the subject. And then by spending as much time as I do in Greece, um, I do meet people and I listen. Um, and the Civil War was a very good case in point, um, you know, that I listened to people who felt very strongly on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, and I never got a, I was never pulled one way or the other. Mm. I always realized right from the beginning that this was, um, you know, somewhere that I had to remain neutral. So my protagonist, because I know you read the book, the protagonist is a woman um, who is drawn in to fight for the communists. You know, she, she's left wing at the beginning you know, she's experienced the famine in Athens, so she, she, she's absolutely grown up to, you know, detest 
the Nazis and the, the sort of the right wing, uh, the collaboration that goes along with that. So she, she sort of, as a teenager, she drifts towards the left. Um, and it becomes almost a given for her that when the Civil War happens, she, she wants to fight. You know, this is the first time when Greek women are, are picking up guns and being allowed to wear trousers, and, and this is Themis. And so off she goes, but of course finds herself um, during the course of that conflict being obliged to commit atrocities herself uh, and living with that terrible burden of guilt um, for the rest of her life and not being at all proud of her activities. You know, she doesn't then wave a red flag. She, she disappears into that post um, civil war life in Athens and, and tries to become a normal person and, and hides what she's done, you know, from her children and from her grandchildren. So, you know, I tried in the complexity of her character um, to convey that this was a war where there were no winners and um, I hope I succeeded. You know, my next question is about this uh War and conflict have been reflected on your books, and your heroes live and love in very difficult times. They, they manage to endure hardship, but they keep struggling to get over traumas. So I guess that literary-wise is, is, uh, is a very nice way to tell a story. So could you tell us a bit more about it? Yes, I suppose um, read, uh, writing in itself um, gives the opportunity for some kind of catharsis even in your, um, just to, to live through the writing of a book. And I think the same happens when, when people read. They can share uh, the trauma and then come through it. I mean, the first novel that I wrote, which was about a pandemic, as it happened, or a, an incurable disease, um, and that faced the characters with this prospect of you know, living with the disease and dying with it. Um, and, of course, that novel had a very clear happy ending, which was the cure for leprosy, uh, which was a, you know, a, a great moment in, in human science and, and history. Um, and a lot of people thought that that book was actually a, um, a sort of metaphorical story. They didn't actually... I mean, I was writing quite genuinely about this place near Crete that had all these thousands of leprosy patients um, and then many of them are cured and they thought it was a, a, a readers can bring anything they like to the reading of a novel they thought it was a metaphorical uh, story about trauma and, and catharsis so I think it, it is very much there in a, in a lot of my stories that you go from the darkness into light um, I mean, I, I never would never write a book where there isn't what I call, in quite simple terms, a happy ending. Uh, because even personally, as a reader, I feel very let down if I get to the end of a story. I think, you know, Anna Karenina, for example, what a, you know, it's a very dark ending. Um, you know, we all forgive Tolstoy and he was a pacifist and all the rest of it, a great, great Russian writer. Um, but I need to give myself a sense of release at the end. You know, at the end of the book, I want to, to feel I haven't left the reader in a dark place. And, um, and in all the, you know, the war, the civil war, you know, th those things came to an end. And I always end the same with the thread, which was set in Thessaloniki, um, end the story on a note of, of optimism. Uh, because even if you know, especially with Greece, um, <laughs> and I always think, I actually learned this, watched this in a, a lecture once at the LSE, uh, given by Stathis Kalivas, mm. great professor at Oxford. <laughs> and he drew this amazing kind of curve of Greek modern history, which is like a, a sort of seismic, um, you know, like if there's an earthquake and it keeps coming back and 
gets a bit higher and then down and up again, and then sooner or later you know there's going to be another one. But this lovely seismic curve is a very good description um, for me of, of how what, Greece, what happens in Greece, which is very different from Britain. You know, we're, I believe we're, we're a bit more of a flat line, no. or a, we're a bit like this. We're a little bit like this. Uh, Tony Blair might be here tomorrow to tell you differently, but I see us like this. I think he would disagree. Whereas Greece is very... Um, you always come up, even if you know there's going to be the next, you know, interesting time. So where are we now? Are we... Uh... Gosh, I think uh. um, right now... Oh, that's a very challenging question. I think we're perhaps going down a little bit again here, but... That's um, not I based have to on. You, we had the crisis for ten years, and then we had the pandemic, yeah. and now we have the war. So as, as Greece, yes. Greece, we you have feel felt very like you're at the bottom and about yeah. to come up again. Yes. Well, I hope that's yeah. Let's hope that's the case. Well, uh, Russia, as well as a part of the Western world, uh, seems to be obsessed with masculinity and putting its own image, uh, riding. Um, a horse being purchased. It's a sort of revival of militarism, patriotism, and some sort of mm. past stereotypes. So, to be frank, I would always what is be. Happening here? I would always be very wary of a man with a bare chest on a horse or on a motorbike. I mean, he looked absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and the problem with 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 Putin, it seems, is that he's got nobody who tells him the truth. You know, and as soon as you, you're surrounded by people, presumably women and men, who told him how fantastic and sexy and macho he looked, you know, that should have been a warning sign, um, you know, of, of a real problem with his personality. What do you think, uh, he has uh, such an appeal to a certain kind of... Um... Gosh, that's very hard to say because, you know... To most of, I'd say probably to all I'll of us say here. More, more to men than to women. Well, that's a real problem with the male ego, isn't it? And I'm, you know, Delphi is very more dominated by men than women, very obviously. Uh, so I hesitate to say anything offensive, but I'm sure there aren't that many men in educated men who would find uh, Putin particularly appealing. Um, in any way whatsoever. You know, that really does, you know, my imagination is reasonably um, developed, but I cannot imagine. Um, I think it's fear, you know, he, he's put himself in this position where he's surrounded by people who fear him. Um, but yes, I mean, he's a particular brand of exaggerated and, you know, almost ridiculous masculinity. Um, you know, from time to time, we have caught a glimpse <clears throat> on British television. We've managed to do some interviews with some Russian uh, female politicians. And, you know, they, they seem very hard as well. Um, and I was like trying Saharova, to... Like yes, yes, yes. I mean, very... Uh, yeah, they, they, they don't seem as though they have anything of the soft and the feminine left in them, although I think some of the so it's very sort of exaggerated blonde hair and very long red nails, which again doesn't indicate that they're, you know, particularly feminine. I mean, I was thinking actually about the, the female leaders that we've had in, in Britain. Of course, you know, we had Mrs. Thatcher, who, um, she was quite masculine in With her Theresa way. May, I wouldn't think. Yes, and she was less so. And then, you know, we've got Marine Le Pen, who, you know, is taking quite a prominent role in the, the election in France on I, I Sunday. Don't want to hear any and, that. you know, we, we need more really, really positive female role models in, in politics. Like in New Zealand or... Absolutely. Yeah. You know, there are, there are some, but there are still not enough. And I, I really sincerely believe that we've never really had the chance to prove this, um, that I think women leaders would 
again, Mrs. Thatcher did take us into the Falklands War, which we're having an anniversary of at the moment. So there's always an exception. But I think women would find it impossible uh, to, to do the things that Putin is doing now, to go in and massacre and destroy the lives of men, women, and children. I just, you know, maybe I'll be proved wrong at some point, but I, I, I find it impossible to believe that a woman would ever take that decision. Uh, we're made differently. And the idea of giving an instruction which would result in, in so much suffering, um, you know, is, is beyond, beyond the realms of my imagination. So we do need, we certainly need more women in politics, and then eventually uh, we'll be in those positions of power. I do have a challenging question for you, though. Mm. Okay, I'm in, <laughs> I'm, I'm in love with Cretan Cretans, so I'm not being objective, and you're not, uh, neither, neither are you, but how about this sense of masculinity in Crete? have the sense of who's the leader of the house, the society. And mm. sometimes you, you, you tend to see in Crete that there is somehow this slough of um, violence or, you know, yes, celebrating is, manhood in a, yes. in a very aggressive way. So how about this? Yes, no, I, I've seen that myself, you know, many times that um, Cretan men like to believe that, you know, they are the powerful macho ones, but Cretan women are quite a force to be reckoned with as well. Um, and I, I, you know, have this on my own house in Crete. The house is called Villa Victoria. You know, I'm in charge of the house and the home and what goes on in that private space. And I think, uh, for me, that's really the important, the important place. Um, but it's never, I've never found it a very, what we call, toxic masculinity in Crete. It's almost a little bit like play acting. Um, you know, when you know, guns are fired in the air at weddings, you know, that's fairly harmless. I've, I've never seen it as anything that's particularly harmful um, to men. And, and, you know, they, it's very clear to me in Crete that there are lots of these very strong male friendship groups and they'll stay up all night playing music, drinking raki, dancing, smashing glasses. Um, that's what they want to do and it doesn't really affect me and the women folk of Crete because we're perfectly happy at home, you know, or in another cafe having a discussion or, or reading or doing something more creative. So it's masculinity, but not of a toxic, not of a, not of a Putin-esque kind in any sense whatsoever. I would like to thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Margarita. For having this privilege to talk to you, and I hope to see you next year with less horrible things to talk about. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.